Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams in Asia? You know how painful it is. Asseville helps your in-house team by taking tough tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across eight countries in Asia Pacific, which includes onboarding, procurement, device management, real-time IT support, offboarding, and more. Gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place with our state-of-the-art platform. Check out Esevel, E-S-E-V-E-L dot com and get a demo today. Use our referral code BRAVE for three months free. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to BRAVE. Be inspired by the best leaders of Southeast Asia tech. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. I'm Jeremy Au, a VC, founder, and father. Mondays for no BS commentary on the latest startup news with Shri and Co, managing partner of Hustle Fund. Thursdays for in-depth interviews of changemakers across the region, sharing about the highs and lows of their lives. Join us and over 10,000 subscribers at www.bravesea.com for transcripts, analysis, and community. Hey, Adriel. Another Q&A session from another listener. So what do you have for me? Yeah, so this um, listener's profile is an executive at a payments, large payments company and is looking to start getting involved as an angel investor and even as an LP in certain funds. So he has questions around those type of stuff. So first, you know, as an angel investor, uh, what are the typical ticket sizes and how much equity should an angel expect from their ticket? So what's interesting is that, you know, these numbers are really for Southeast Asia, which is a very large market with different geographies, right? And each geography has also their own specific dynamics. I would say, and feel free to disagree with me, whoever's listening, is that I think the entry level is probably around $5,000 for many startups, especially, for example, in countries like Philippines or, you know, kind of like areas that have less capital. Uh, and then it may be a bit higher, for example, maybe around the 10 grand mark in Singapore, right? Or Indonesia. And then obviously that floats up all the way to as much as you want to put in, but you may see up to like, you know, 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand, even 100 grand for, you know, angel check sizes, right? Depending on their approach and how much conviction they have. Um, I think what we're also seeing is that as there are more angel syndicates and SPV vehicles are starting to be built. And so they're trying to push that floor down to like about $1,000 so that anybody who is um, accredited, but is willing to kind of like come in, gets the opportunity to come in. So that's an interesting dynamic where they're trying to make it more accessible to folks. I think the tricky part that was asked was for how much equity would such a check size give you? And obviously at one level is the more money you put in, the more equity you're going to get, right? And so I think that makes a lot of investors who are excited about company tend to put in larger check sizes. What's unclear, of course, is that what is the exact price for each quantum of dollar that you put in? And so the truth of the matter is that the market in Southeast Asia has pretty much moved away from price rounds that historically used to be priced, you know, say even five years ago was very common in Southeast Asia. But now I think almost everybody is using some version of the safe note, which is a form of convertible debt. And the other way of saying it is that there is no assignment of the price for that quantum, but it is determined by the price of the next round when an institutional investor comes in and does a transaction, does a due diligence, does a negotiation and sets a price. And so at the next funding round, hopefully in two years, for example, then all these safe notes, convertible debt gets converted at the same time. And so on average, the angel investors who came in around earlier than the institutional seed investors should hopefully get more a, a lower price. Or another way of saying is that they tend to get more shares for the equivalent same quantum that the institutional investor gets. In other words, earlier investors are rewarded for taking on that risk premium by getting a little bit more ownership for the same buck. Now that's theoretical. I think what we've seen actually, of course, is that a lot of the safe notes, especially for high performing companies, and when I say high performing is that they're good at fundraising or they have very great revenue numbers, is that they tend to have reset, I think what used to be the two variables that used to give this reward for taking on the risk premium. So 
that would be the discount rate as well as the valuation cap. So discount rates, historically, for example, was very common to see a 20% discount rate, which basically means that, hey, for coming in this round early, two years in advance of the next round, you will basically get 20% more shares compared to the person who comes in in two years' time, which I think is actually very theoretically sound, especially because if you look at, at the numbers out there, there's actually, I think, at least a 50% death rate from the angel round to the next round, or you may even argue is even higher on average if you include just all the other startups that try to raise. And so what that kind of implies a little bit is that I think the average investor, angel investor, tends to actually already take on too much risk <laughs> because they're not adequately compensated for the, the risk of coming in two years early for that 50% death rate, but they only get 20% discount for the upside, right? So that being said, I think obviously there's a fair point that for the best high-performing companies, et cetera, the reason why they no longer have discount rates is because they're basically saying like, this is your only chance to be able to come in. So better for you to come in early. Otherwise, you're going to be squeezed out by the seed investors down the road. So that being said, discount rates disappeared during the bull markets of 2021 and even 2022. And what's interesting to see in 2023 already is that discounts rates are starting to come back. Because again, I think it's just a fun, you know, it's a market setting price mechanism between the supply of capital from angel investors and the demand for capital, right? By founders who need capital. So there's this pricing mechanism or equilibrium that's starting to be debated. And then called valuation caps are also quite complicated. And I we're saying that is if the company outperforms that target, that valuation cap, then the early investors get rewarded for that. Which again, is a nice way of saying that if you're super bullish in a company, then, you know, you get a bump on that. You can see where it breaks down pretty fast. Again, because quantitatively, 50% of companies at least die in this stage. And it's hard to predict which ones are. So on average, most angel investors, especially newer angel investors, are too optimistic on average. And so I think this is often something that angel investors kind of like understand the math only two years in or three years in. And then they kind of like, oh, no, I didn't really get rewarded for a whole range of outcomes. For example, like they hit their performance target or they were below the performance target, but still viable. Then there's no spread of reward. So personally, I think if you're an angel investor, I think if you have a choice, I think a discount rate of 20% gives you a flat, consistent reward for coming in two years early and being the first believers in a company across a whole range of outcomes from average to above average to great performance. So I think that's what I recommend angel investors to look at. But I think the market probably uses more valuation caps. So all in all, I think what the price is, is set at the end of the day down the road by the next round of investors. But I think the question is how much more of a premium do you get? And so I really recommend the book called Venture Deals by Brad Feld. There's also a lot of online courses around safe notes. But I think these are great ways to train and understand the math because you have to do the math, right? That being said, when you think about that, you have to think about price, but also you have to think about the death rate or in the converse of that is your ability to pick the winners, unicorn pick rate, as well as thinking about capital efficiency, right? How much capital are they going to raise? Because at the end of the day, what you get at the end of the transaction in 10 years or 15 years is what is the capital diluted ownership stake at the end of that time period. And so, for example, if the company obviously died, then you get nothing, right? If the company was highly successful, you get more money. That being said, if the company was uh, highly capital efficient, then you get more money. But if the company was burned a lot of cash and was capital inefficient, then they had to raise a lot of funding. And so your dilution of that ownership stake is quite substantial. And so you have a much smaller stake than you would have had, even though it was a successful outcome, right? So I think you think about those three, think of it as a triangle, like what's the price that you're getting in at right now? Of course, second is your ability to pick the winners and also to avoid picking the companies that will die. And the third, of course, is the capital efficiency that you expect for the investment. So as a result, what that means is that price does matter and it's one part of that tripod. That being said, you have to act as part of a syndicate because most angels don't have negotiating leverage. And so... You know, to some extent, if you can't negotiate, then why think about price? Just take the price. But if you can negotiate with other folks, then that's worth discussing with the founder. And I think one thing that's also a bit underrated is if you are deploying certain ticket sizes and deploying equity, you're making a decision about the price. Um, 
do you also actually improve the startup's odds? So if you actually help the startup substantially and you actually help improve the odds, you double their success rate, et cetera, then to some extent you could probably use that to negotiate a better price or you can be more comfortable with a more expensive price to you because you know that the success rate would be much higher than the market would expect it to be. And, you know, I think after this, there's also this question about when you invest in a fund as an LP, is it possible to request for allocation on specific initiatives? Yeah, so, you know, I'm going to take this question as like in specific initiatives as in can you go towards certain investment verticals or can you go for certain mandates? And the answer is that for the general LP, the answer is no, because your ticket size is probably too small for the fund to justify a whole novel structure to, you know, especially when there's so many other LPs to do, right? So you can imagine that's a big decision. And the truth is, if you really do believe that specific initiatives that you really believe in, maybe it's better for you to look for a fund that actually reflects those full initiatives within their mandate, right? Rather than look, trying to incentivize a fund to kind of like do those sub things. That being said, if you are like the largest LP, for example, you're a very large institution compared to a small fund or, you know, you're by far the anchor investor. So you are the first investor and you're doing a very large chunk of the total, you know, first capital call, for example, then you may have leverage to be able to do that request, right? So perhaps you may request for like, you know, a common one is requesting for specific ESG goals to be reported and metrics to be collated and achieved. Or perhaps you may mandate and ask for the opportunity to be able to have the first right to co-invest in a follow-on round, for example. So the answer is generally no, but there are exceptions, especially if you're the largest LP for them. And how about pitfalls to avoid, whether it's an LP or angel? Uh, I think I'll focus more on the angel side. You know, I think first of all is overall, the truth is technology is really hard, right? And what that means is that AngelList, for example, had data that only one in 40 US startups that have received a high quality seed round will actually make it to become a unicorn eventually. And that's really tough odds. This is the US ecosystem that is more mature, more capital, and probably more curated than that of, for example, in Southeast Asia. And, you know, it's just a hard domain to build, right? And so a lot of respect goes to founders who are willing to take those odds and build for the future. For a lot of investors, as a result, they underestimate how hard it is. And so if you have 140, I always tell it's like effectively equivalent to roulette, right? So, you know, how many spins out of the roulette wheel do you have to do in order for it to be successful? So what has to be done is, first of all, is understand that you have a growth curve. Roulette is hard, right? And so the truth is the average investor is picking effectively, the average investor is picking at average, right? Because this, you know, average investors pick average track record, right? And again, all these companies will have some high quality signal. That's why they receive a seed capital, right? So I think tech is hard to build and tech investing is also hard, right? Because you have limited capital. And so I think the pitfall to avoid is to avoid underestimating how hard it is that this field is and therefore how hard it is to actually invest and pick the winners. So what that means is that some folks perhaps they come in, they think it feels easy. It feels like there's a lot of great people. They're very excited and they tend to invest a lot. They tend to invest early and they tend to invest quickly. And so what they undervalue is that you know, they're going to get smarter over time as they see more and more companies, right? They see at least 40, 80, 120, 160, 400, right? And as you see more and more companies, then their ability to discern companies improves over time. And so what you may find is that a lot of angels who kind of like got much smarter in one year, two years, three years, four years, but then ended up having insufficient capital for this latter part period of their investing time because they spent all of it upfront. That's one way to think about it. Another pitfall is investing the tickets are too large. So it's another version of what we just said, which was investing too early in, in the early experience curve. But this version is you're investing very large tickets. And the reason why investing large tickets can be a problem is that again, obviously you're excited for the company. So you think it's going to be a success. So you're always going to put in more quantum because you think that is going to give you 
more ownership. So I think broadly that makes sense. You always want to put more money in the companies that you're more confident about. That being said, this is a portfolio. So in investing, they say diversification is the only free lunch in investing. And what that means is that the truth is, even though you think they're great, perhaps they're insufficiently diversified for geography or founder type or vertical or approach or go to market. And so basically you need to aim for a portfolio actually of about 40 investments. And you perhaps want to disperse that across, you know, for example, four years, right? Or five years or six years, but you want to disperse that over a certain period of time because so that you have different time diversification for the vintages, right? And you generally want to, again, because of the experience curve we just mentioned, you want to invest less in the earlier years and invest more in year three, year four, year five. And you want to have about that 40 investments because, again, because that gives you a better chance to be able to have, uh, be able to pick versus if your portfolio was just like, for example, five investments. I think the math shows quite statistically, quite clearly that you have a much worse chance of actually generating return because you're much more likely to miss that one out of 40 chance that generates that unicorn outcome. So I think there's a good benchmark. I think some people obviously aim for more, they aim for 100 investments, for example, but they may do that over 10 years. So I think just being thoughtful about that is quite key. The last thing that I think is a bit underappreciated is actually invest in yourself first, right? And then invest in like, you know, for example, your health insurance, then your non-health insurance, then your uh, house, then your stocks, then your bonds, right? And then maybe your exotic instruments, which includes private capital, like LP investments or uh, angel investments. And uh, the reason why, of course, is that um, to be very frank, you know, your angel investments or even your LP investments are very illiquid. You know, they can only be there and be cashed out in 10 or more years, which means that, you know, it takes forever to unlock it, right? So, and with no guarantee of return, right? Uh, because we don't know whether you're a good investor or not. And so this illiquidity of the investment basically effectively means that you can't use it for anything else. You can't use it to pay for your kid's school. You can't use it to pay for class. You can't use it for your, you know, health insurance. So this capital is effectively locked away. And it's so hard to unlock it because if you want to sell secondaries, for example, in the VC fund or in the individual investments that you made, these secondary sales are, can be at 30% or even up to 50% discount versus the actual value, which effectively wipes out any of the gains that you have from picking, which makes it very, I think, ineffective as a way to get liquidity, right? So in other words, I think you want to invest in the fundamental layers first. And if you're trying to get investment experience, then yeah, if you have to do it, just do the smallest check possible, join syndicates, put in one grand and lean towards that lower end at the start and then kind of ramp up over time. Once you get more comfortable, with the actual reward risk dynamics of angel investments. Yep. And I think the next question we have is aspiring angel is thinking about what are the top three initiatives this year and whether there are any related to like media and art. So I think what are some of the themes and sector trends that you're seeing in relation to that from a VC funding perspective? Well, uh, I think the past few years, it was all about NFTs, right? Non-fungible tokens, which is the concept of digital scarcity. It does feel like the wave has passed, especially with the crash of the asset prices, where the truth of the matter is, I think digital scarcity is a real thing. I think it's a great invention and innovation to cryptographically create unique items. So I do think obviously there's value there in terms of technology. I just think that using it as an investment instrument uh, or even as a commodity, I think it's very much subject to actual intrinsic value of this asset, right? Compared to the infinite copies they can make of the asset as well, effectively. So I think let's not confuse the two things. I think there's real value with NFTs, non-fungible to tokens and digital scarcity, which will continue to be relevant for media and art in the medium to long term. But I think a lot of the hype has been let out of the entire wave. And so I think there's a bit of a sober conversation now, which is how does NFTs, for example, really relate to that? I think the second thing that's a key initiative is really, of course, generative AI, which is basically a concept of AI generating content, right? So historically, AI, you know, was a function of 
digitizing, for example, things that were very automatable. So primarily numbers, right? So for example, the concept of Excel and accounting and we call it AI automation or just rule-based or scenarios, but the core concept was basically numbers will flow from A to B to C and, you know, there's a certain logic to it, right? And so I think there was a big future where I think McKinsey did a good report, which was like, hey, you know, accountants are at very high risk of AI, you know, automation and replacement because, you know, they're just doing math, right? And so computers can totally do math. What really came out of nowhere was that the concept that digital designers uh, and writers, you know, actually, if you actually look at that McKinsey report on digitization, it was not really considered to be high risk, right? Uh, because, you know, it was felt that there was a level of creativity and, you know, uh, value of work um, that just made it hard to replace, right? And what we, it has turned out is that actually because the whole internet has been open, you know, basically AI was able to scrape, you know, live journal, Tumblr, Twitter, you know, everybody's web pages, blogs, every news article, um, and has been able to basically use that database to pass. And obviously with, uh, you know, GPT 3.5 and now GPT 4 coming up, uh, be able to transform and basically use those content and resynthesize patterns, right? Out of that thing. And it turns out that most of us who are writers, <laughs> Not much better than AI, right? Because of it just passing what we read and then we rewrite it. Uh, so I, I think it's not that AI is, has gotten really good. I think it's just that the average writer has given themselves too much credit, including myself, about what the novelty is in terms of writing, right? Um, and so I think generative AI is, um, I think, a big piece. And I think a lot of startups are trying to reskin or create a very thin layer to, you know, kind of like apply this generative AI. So they're trying to create. Uh, for example, unlimited ads creation for the copy and the images for startups, right? Uh, or another one I think I've seen is that they want to automate the writing of children's books, right? For other you know parents, right? So they're just trying to like replace and create that highly personalized, infinite content creation, uh, but also hopefully more curated or you know tailored, right? For to hit that that mainstream requirement. So and of course do that at you know, effectively almost zero cost or very low cost, right? So I think that's a really crazy thing that's happened. And I think this honestly is way more transformative in many ways, I think, um, because the previous what we talked about was the monetization of a new content category. But this, what we're doing is we're actually breaking the cost barrier, right? And curve of what content means. Um, and I think what that means, honestly, is a third, uh, trend that comes out from media and art is I think there's going to be a barbelling of the content creation industry. So what that means is that I think historically, you know, I think the biggest example from my perspective is this is like the creation of the mechanical loom. So historically, the people used to weave, right? So there was this huge weaving industry where, you know, uh, folks at home would basically sew, right? And they'll sew quilts and clothes and all these things. And so basically they were like literally like, you know, uh, you know millions of garments being built across sold across hundreds of thousands of homes. And obviously there were great uh, weavers and there were like average weavers and there were weavers who were not really very good, right? And so there's a very nice, you can call it, you know, bell curve of weavers, right? But with the mechanical loom, basically they automated the creation of, you know, you can call it blankets, you can call it clothes and so, so forth, but they automated the weaving of it, right? Using, you know, uh, you know steam power, electric power, but also, you know, they simplified the job tremendously, right? And basically what it did was that it barbelled the industry. So instead of creating kind of like a bell curve, it created a, a, a barbell, right? So the middle disappeared, which is that basically, you know, on one end, um, you had all these uh, folks who basically became factories, right? So factory owners basically built these giant factories with lots of mechanical looms and with lots of low-skilled labor to basically generate lots of high commoditized you can call it low quality, but, you know, it was good average quality, you know, acceptable quality, but at a much lower price, right? And so, you know, the middle class weaver just disappeared, right? And they had to reskill, retrain, and do something else or, you know, join one or the other, right? And these uh, mechanical factory owners won. And on the other side, you know, you had this flight, right, to quality in the sense that some of that, folks save themselves by becoming very artisanal, very bespoke, very 
high quality uh, weaving, right, for the nobility and for the upper class because, you know, and so, you know, it's like, okay, you know, if you're trying for a million white shirts, you're never going to get it, right? You know, but, you know, if you're looking for that bespoke silk or be and velvet combo that is directly tailored to your size and so so forth, right? Like that just could not be automated, you know, at that point of time. And so people were able to create that, you know, artisanal luxury approach, right? I think that's going to happen to content actually, which is, I think most people will just, average writers, right? You know, uh, and, um, and average writers doesn't mean necessarily mean that they can't write good quality content. But the truth of the matter was that to write great quality content was going to take a week, a lot of time, you know, or you could write something pretty terrible in like 30 minutes, right? And so most people were kind of average writers are kind of like in that dynamic, including myself, right? And what's going to happen is that when you have generated AI that can basically make something really, you know, better than my terrible writing, but do that for free and do that in one minute <laughs> effectively, plus some editing, or they could, me and you, me using AI could generate a high quality piece, but do that in three days instead of like seven days, you know, because of, you know, that to fro. Then basically what is going to happen is that there's no, there's the, the average stay home writer doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> or this average stay home designer doesn't exist anymore. And so I think what we're going to see is that the folks, the factories are really going to be able to best leverage this AI because they can mechanize it. They can have the best practices. They have the capital um, and they can use, you know, cheaper than average labor to do what that happens, right? And so I think we really started seeing that now, right? Which is, I think CNET and BuzzFeed both announced that they're going to use a ton of generated AI content. And so they, you know, CNET is basically saying, hey, we generate a whole bunch of really standardized content that's SEO friendly, right? So stock prices, uh, you know, you can even argue product reviews, right, are highly standardized. And so instead of paying this person a couple hundred dollars to write it and take, you know, I don't know, two days to write and actually try it for themselves, they can pay one cent, right, and get it done in, you know, one minute, right? And so, you know, for them, instead of generating a hundred great pieces, they should generate you know, a million acceptable pieces and Google just gets totally swamped and says, says this is the best content we've ever seen. And, you know, just steers all the, you know, traffic, right? Uh, so the conversion rate is lower per page, but, you know, you have, you went for a million times more web pages. It doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so I think the factory owners will win. And I think the best writers are going to flee towards writing very, like, membership, gated content, prove that they actually thought about it, prove that they actually are able to deliver it, right? Maybe they show that they're writing, they show that they're speaking, <laughs> show that they're actually thinking about it, right? Uh, so that it's going to be a, this artisanal, uh, you know, writer, right? Or designer that can do something really special, right? So I think that's good. That's, those are the three trends, right? I know NFTs, obviously, which is digital scarcity. Second thing is generative AI and the, the tin slash tick layer on top of it. And the third is the barbelling of the creator industry. Yeah, I think we had a great conversation on the eutrophication of the internet, right? And how, you know, the desire for authenticity and the need for authenticity will get stronger and stronger. And, you know, how then you like proof that your content is authentic. And I guess the great thing is now, hey, we have proof that we are two real human beings talking to each other on video and the state of deep fakes is not that advanced to create such an artificial reality yet, but maybe in time to come, it will. So good luck to us then. At that point of time, then what we're going to flee to is going to flee to Fireside live chats to show that we're actually not being deep faked yeah. and not being replaced by something else. Yeah. So that the, the flight to quality and proof of humanity will continue to happen. Yeah, but it, isn't it so fascinating because you started off with that, right? And then the internet came and everyone started to go online, social media, whether it's tags, video, audio. And then now because of how AI has happened, that lack of authentic authenticity is like pushing people back into the real world again to see authenticity and realness before like the volume of content or the access to information. I just find that reversal so fascinating. A bit like just how, you know, we think about Uber and taxis, right? We were pushed to Uber from the usage of taxis and then now people are like, oh, actually right here is too expensive. Let me just go back to like 
taxis, right? But guess what? Because all the taxi prices are now way higher than what they used to be because of Grab's and Uber's existence. Uh, so I think our next question is around what do funds look for in their investment managers today? I guess maybe you have sort of hired a bunch of VCs yourself or have overseen that process, right? So could you give the listeners some insight into that? I think funds are looking for investment managers who will find, choose, and shepherd a company that becomes a billion dollars, right? And so I think the way I always explain it is like, you know, in funds, if they could, they'll invent a time machine, right? And they'll peak in the future, right? They fast forward 20 years and they say, okay, you successfully found and closed and did three deals that all became billion dollar companies. Or heck, even if you do one, I think it's really good, right? Then they'll just dial back, jump back in the time machine, back to the present day and say like, look, you're hired, right? So they're really looking for that certainty in their mind that you are actually going to do that. Of course, there's no such thing as a time machine. So, but they're trying to do that mental forecast that you're going to be able to achieve that outcome. So in the absence of that, then they will probably look for the track record of you doing so, right? Or they can see that there's a trajectory for you to be able to do so. So that's where the ability, uh, and we discussed that in an earlier Q&A that we'll hyperlink to. But at the end of the day, you know, they're looking for people who can source across the network, who are able to be thoughtful in their decision making about what actually makes a great founder, a great company with great tailwinds. And lastly, to actually be able to shepherd them in terms of adding value, for example, by increasing to the upside, by you know hiring or connections and strategic advice, but also preventing downside risk by you know catching fraud or, or making sure that they adhere to certain board practices for the next stage. So I think those are the three things that you know funds are really looking for: the ability to find, the ability to pick, and the ability to shepherd future unicorns. Yep, and I think this brings us to our final question from this listener, which is, given his extensive corporate experience as a partnerships director at a large payments company, how should he position himself for a VC? Yeah, so with your finance experience, I would probably say that it's relevant to fintech because there are lots of banks that are potential partnerships in terms of go-to-market. There are also potential future customers. And to some extent, again, you know, you understand know your customer or anti-money laundering, a whole bunch of other skills and domain expertise that honestly are really difficult for someone outside to really understand, especially if you haven't ever been in a bank. That being said, of course, one of the key concerns from a fund perspective is that if you spend like five years at a large bank, do you actually have the DNA? For example, I think we had an earlier Q&A where the person was a founder, right? So now in your case, the question would be, hey, can, do you actually have empathy for, for the founder? Is your advice going to be suited for startups or is it going to be more suited for large companies? Are you going to act in a big executive way within the fund, which is not often very entrepreneurial, or are you going to act as a great teammate who's kind of like jumping on initiatives and getting stuff done? So I think that's really the pros, are again, like domain expertise that you often can have and the network that you can have. But then now the contrast is in this case, you actually have to demonstrate that you actually have empathy as well as the ability to give the relevant advice for the role. And yeah, that's the end of our listener Q&A. Thank you so much, Sherry, for sharing all those insights and your personal anecdotes. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share this episode with friends and colleagues. Sign up at www.jeremyow.com to discuss this episode with other community members in our forum. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.